Ah, Doctor Who. The world's longest running science fiction television series has been thrilling audiences with exciting adventures in time and space since it first materialized in 1963. A Time Lord from the planet Gallifrey, the Doctor, in his many incarnations, has battled Daleks, Cybermen, Zygons, Bandrels, and been a constant companion to legions of fans around the world. This film examines the fandom of Doctor Who. Conventions, fan clubs, merchandise, fan films, stage shows. It's all here in this dimensionally transcendental Doctor Who documentary. So join us as we explore the love behind Doctor Who. Come along. I want to see what's behind all this. My earliest memory of Doctor Who, God, that's almost the easiest question to ask because I was one of the ones that, who saw the first episode. Years later, I read that review that said it was one of the most imaginative uses of television to convey the idea of travelling through time ever. It's just such a, such a great format that you can go anywhere and do anything, not just the Doctor, but the viewer as well. In your, in your own mind, you can travel the length and breadth and depth of the universe. My earliest memories of Doctor Who um, a way back in uh, 1966, um, Tomb of the Cybermen, Evil of the Daleks. So um, it was a great time to get into Doctor Who if you like monsters. Because the series itself has such charm and interest, it has such a rich detail of world, the imagination, that as a small child you had no real choice but to be a fan. It just drew you in episode after episode until you were completely encapsulated by it. And really, uh, William Hartnell's Doctor and Patrick Troutman's Doctor, they were my childhood heroes, I suppose you could say. The programme made such a tremendous impact on me when I was very young. The first story I saw was Robot with Tom Baker, and from that moment I was able to tap in on the programme's magical charm. Ah, yeah, my earliest memory of Doctor Who is waiting for our old 405 line television to warm up. I go, ah, I can hear it, but I can't see it. It's been around for so long, I think there's, there's something very satisfying about it. Uh, something that's existing there in the background for so many people. And they don't need, necessarily need to tune in, but they need to know that it's there. People have occasionally asked me, you know, why I'm a Doctor Who fan. And I think, am I a Doctor Who fan? I don't know. It's, it's sort of like, I never really thought I was a Doctor Who fan. I thought I was just, it's just my native mythology. I felt comfortable with it. I think it started off as, as a memory thing for me, because one of the uh, earliest memories for me is being a child and sitting sitting with my brother and, and watching this this show and you have that ingrained in you as a memory. It's that question like why do you like chocolate or why do you like watching tennis instead of cricket? You don't know there's something something deep in your psyche clicks you into liking Doctor Who. Oh, I think I've been a Doctor Who fan just about as long as I can remember. Really, my earliest memory is of John Pertwee from Carnival of Monsters. I've just always been into Doctor Who. Always been into it. I don't know why. I mean, I like sci-fi. I like Star Trek. I like Stargate. But I mean, Doctor Who is the one thing that keeps me. You know, if, if there's a perennial, it's Doctor Who. And I think the job of Doctor Who is two jobs. It's that of the craft itself, and there's that of the celebrity. When I first watched Doctor Who, it was, it was for me a scene where a, a Con Baker was being dragged into this pit of like hands, and he was like sinking in this quicksand. And I think it's it's images like that that ingrain themselves in, 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 in your mind. Something about the Doctor, because he's kind of like a free spirit, and he's escaping from something. I think uh, that's what appeals to you at an early age. It's about enjoying being an outsider as opposed to really wanted to be on the inside. Um, my earliest memory though was John Pertwee. That's the earliest one, I think it was the mega story. My favourite Doctor is the fifth Doctor and I have a tattoo to prove it. Yes I do, I have a seal of Just there. I've got that one as well, it's my mum drop. And I've got these two. My earliest memory of Doctor Who would be sat at my grandparents on a Saturday and Sarah Jane falling over and her face falling off. I've always liked escapist fiction. I don't know why. I've always, since a young age, I've always liked science fiction, fantasy, anything which is out of this world. And I just grew up with it. I'm Steve Hatcher, and I've been a Doctor Who fan uh, all 40 odd years uh, since back in the 60s. I'm a Doctor Who fan because it's simply the best program I'll. That always has been whenever it's been on. It's half term and um, 
um, I didn't really like Doctor Who at that. It was just some TV show which people talked about. And then um, I saw it won two BAFTAs, and so I said, ooh, it must be a good series. So I started watching the Chris Braxton episodes, and I started liking it from there. The first thing I remember about Doctor Who is the Daleks. This is everything I wanted when I was a child. You know, this is this is my childhood turned into one solid object. I, I started watching Doctor Who from the very first season as a, as a young lad uh, back in 1963-64. I was a massive fan from 11 years old and then when I was 14 I met some fellow Doctor Who fans and we all thought, as was the culture at the time, let's do a fan thing. I suppose the, the way that Doctor Who has had the profoundest impact on my life is it provoked me to build a Dalek and because I built a Dalek, um, I've kind of ended up doing what I am doing now, editing videos, sound, and doing music and so forth. I discovered fandom probably around 1975, 76. What had happened was that from about 1974, for reasons that I can't fathom, I stopped throwing things away to do with the show. It's, it started, I suppose, with sending off the, the little postal order for the, uh, for the Doctor Who fan club magazine. And I, I think I was expecting something like a Star Trek poster mag to arrive, you know, something that was uh, rather like what was kind of being put out by the BBC at the time with the 10th anniversary specials. So I thought, oh, this is interesting. So I joined the DOAS in, towards the end of 1976. The turning point was when Philip Hinchcliffe promoted the Doctor Who Appreciation Society as part of the launch of the Mask of Mandragora season. The Doctor Who Appreciation Society was formed in 1976 and uh, as of 2006 the society is obviously 30 years old. In that time the society, like the programme, has grown and changed from its early humble beginnings. Uh, the Doctor Who Appreciation Society was an almost historic society that catalogued the adventures of the past. From, I guess, the mid-70s I, I got involved with um, Doctor Who fandom. Uh, for want of a better term, I joined the Doctor Who fan club, the original one, and then the Doctor Who Appreciation Society. Um, and I soon started writing for their fanzines. Um, from there, I graduated to editing my own fanzines uh, and co-editing fanzines with people like um, David Howe and Mark Stamets. We did a fanzine called The Frame. I was involved in a fanzine called um, The Frame, um, which I was doing with uh, my friend Stephen Walker and Mark Stammers. And we've been doing this fanzine um, for two or three years, I think, at the time. So we did a fan single called Peladon, uh, which probably sold to maybe 200 people at the time, but 200 people at that age seems like a million. And then we, we did a few issues of that, went to conventions, very much as fans, you know, we were into queuing up and getting autographs. 1977 was the first ever convention in August in Battersea. You literally were sailing over Niagara Falls in a barrel with no idea about how deep the, the fall was on the other side. I'd heard that they were doing fan magazines and stuff at this convention. So I decided I wanted to have my own fan magazine at the convention, so I started up a thing called the Surbiton Doctor Who Society Local Group Magazine. It was a bit of a mouthful. To reiterate, Philip Hinchcliffe was enormously supportive of the programme. And if he could do something, and even if it was only just, you know, pass your name and address on to somebody. So we got access to being able to write at their home addresses to people like John Pertwee and um, special effects people like Matt Irvin and saying, look, you know, we're thinking of doing this, would you like to come along? And because of the time, uh, even someone as, as money orientated as, as John was, um, could see a benefit to himself and thinking, gosh, yeah, so might be press there, might they? Yeah, well, okay, I'll come along to that. And so, <laughs> strange though it seems now, um, there was none of this fee structure in place, it was just a, well, yeah, I think I'm free, so I can come along in the morning. So straight away you had your, your sort of guest list that was enough for, right, Pertwee and special effects in the, in the morning, big star guests, Louise Jameson and, and uh, Tom Baker in the afternoon with a, a smattering of other people and showings and episodes, so we knew we had the timetable, uh, the venue, <laughs> uh, which um, you know, it was the most unglamorous place you've ever seen in your life, at a church hall at the back end of a church in Battersea. The first convention I ever went to was in 1987 and therefore is my earliest memory. I was 16 years old and I went to the Imperial College in London to see a huge variety of Doctor Who celebrities, writers, producers, people I'd never seen before and it was eye-opening and from that moment I knew one that I was a Doctor Who fan 
and B, I'd be going back to lots, lots more. Um, my earliest memory of a convention was in 2003, and somehow I discovered that, that there was Gallifrey here in Los Angeles, and I've been living in Los Angeles since I was five, so I'm like, what the hell, I could have been here all this time, and so I went, and it was an absolute blast, and Peter Davison was there, and he's one of my favorites, so I was really up there, I was really excited. The first convention I ever went to was in 1986, and it was Colin Baker's last season, and I remember sitting in the audience watching um, the first episode of Mysterious Planet go out live. So that was my exper first experience of, you know, fan conventions. I'd never been to one before and it was all sort of exciting and new and seeing these people in the flesh, uh, so to speak. Uh, my name is John John Davis and I'm at Barking at some beach and sex here. Hello, my name's Peter and I've got my autograph board here from Doctor Who. And as you see, I've got a lot of them here. And my dad helped me collect these with the letters and stuff. I try and get up to the Dimensions event in Stockton, which is the friendliest convention around. I um, love that one. And uh, this is the second time I've been down here to the Invasion event, which uh, again is a nice one day event. With uh, good variety of I am finding my first convention appearance quite surreal, but quite wonderful. You signed a lot of autographs. I've signed, how many have I signed? About 140 or something. Meeting the fans at the convention was, uh, it was great. There was some, everyone was just lovely, but there was, I had, I had one girl who came up to me who was, um, he just sort of stared at me for, for quite a long time and then told me she was going to go and get in some makeup. I had, had photos taken with her and um, yeah, it was just it was just all very surreal. This is my face, <laughs> which is not quite the same as the first ones because we ran out. <laughs> they should look like that. They should, oh, we should look, look like that. that. The funny thing about going to a convention as a guest and doing a panel, that does feel very odd. Sometimes I sort of feel like a complete fraud you know why why am i why why up here best experience i ever had as a guest at a convention was uh, was one i did in um los angeles a couple of years ago and for the entire weekend you know i was, I was treated as a celebrity and doing doing um panels with um people i'd seen the night before on on television i went to one when i was i think it was 17 called genesis which was in bournemouth uh, that's where I was living at the time, and um, it was great. It was just my first sort of hands-on experience with the Doctor Who world off of the TV. And I think uh, Colin Baker was there, and uh, Elizabeth Sladen was there as well. And it was great. It was just like being that close to all your, you know, your childhood icons. Every time I've been to an American convention, I didn't have to queue for very long because I always got the all-access seating at Chicago Tardis, meaning I get to get the signs first. Signatures first. Yeah, American fans are different to British fans in that not only do they get enthusiastic about the, the programme in the same way as, as fans over here do, but they do it without any of the huge inhibitions that I think a lot of people over here get very quite shy about. Who's got a fan, really? Um, they get that kind of the, this motif of the, of the anorak, the sad person, etc. Uh, which again is a, is a late 80s, 90s expression. Even the word anorak you never heard much before the late 80s. Whereas the Americans always attack this with this sort of gigantic enthusiasm, this, this big gung ho approach that looks, that they, and they steam in like children let loose in a, in a playset. So when I do that work, there's been a Doctor Who convention or a BBV or an audio tape. All, all, all kinds of little spin-off jobs that uh, I'm extremely grateful for. I did start a journal once, and it was basically Leela's journal. And so I went through um, each episode with Tom Baker, I'd watch it, and I'd type out kind of like her inner thoughts. <laughs> so I did that one. This American fan came up, and he had a complete uh, Sylvester McCoy costume. Hey Alistair, are you, are you going to be doing any signings? Uh, well, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a celebrity, I'm just, just, I'm just an editor. Ah gee, you know, I, I had a couple of CDs for you to sign. 
and he opened this box and there were at least 30 CDs uh, that he wanted me to sign for him. So I did. Perhaps the nicest I've met was Deborah Watling. She was a true lady and just very fun and very kind to just about everyone that I saw. That was, she was probably my most favorite. Uh, the longest I've ever queued for an autograph would be four hours. The longest I had to queue for was probably Paul McGann. Actually, maybe Paul McGann, and it was at least a couple hours outside. I think probably the longest I've ever queued to meet a Doctor Who actor was Tom Baker in 1991. Tom Baker up until that point had been very elusive on the convention scene and I remember myself and some friends went to the crypt of St Martin's in the field where Tom Baker was signing a video called Who on Earth is Tom Baker. For me to get there at 9 and to queue until 12 o'clock when the signing started, that was probably the longest I, I stayed waiting but I have to say it was well worth the wait. Hi, I'm Jason, and I'm dressed as the Tenth Doctor. Thank you, Tim. Okay, the only um, Doctor Who character I've dressed up as has been Leela, just because um, I think she was the most scantily clad. <laughs> so, I had to go there. I'd like to go because um, I really want to see those odd people that sort of dress up in those silly costumes and them. Um... I'm often asked whether I've dressed up as my favourite Doctor or companion over the years that I've been a Doctor Who fan. If you'd seen me however aged five in circular 1976, any available dressing gown or long scarf may well have become victim to my Doctor Who games. But that's not to say I don't dress up in private. Obey me! I am the master. But it's just interesting to see the detail that people go through to create costumes that are exactly like that on the show. There are certain types of fans. There are fans who like to watch the episodes and want to get the autographs. There are fans up another class which are go to the conventions as well and really get stuck in. I am the producer and coordinator of Who at the Cabin. It's our third event. I've got Peter Davison who's a chapter called Hero which is quite quite excited about. And um, we've got Colin Baker coming back again and this is gonna be his third cabin event with us. And of course we've got Toby Hado who's our MC. <laughs> Today until she marries Peter Davison, so <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nice to uh, uh, be here in Liverpool. I thought I'd say that. Um, uh, and uh, we're here at the, the, the Cavern Club, obviously, which is, uh, of course, famous for the Beatles, who are best known in this country for appearing in episode one of The Chase. Uh, I think that's what it says on their Wikipedia entry. That's what happens when you give Doctor Who fans access to the internet. I'm sure under Laurence Olivier, it says British stadium to most famous for turning down the role of the mutant in Revelation of the Daleks. But, uh, the event is for Alder Hay Children's Hospital. So any, any profit left over at the end of the event, after we've paid, obviously, everything we've got to pay out goes to all the night. I first got the idea of doing the Doctor Who cruises back in the 1980s. At the time, I was working at an annual convention in Florida called Omnicon. We used to have the Doctor Who guests over every year, and the convention was lots of fun, but my mother, who was working as a travel agent in those days, saw the craziness that we used to go through dealing with the hotel every year. After the third or fourth year of her telling me how much easier the cruise lines are to deal with, I called her bluff and checked it out. Turned out she was pretty much right, and uh, in 1988 we held our first convention on board one of the cruise lines. Our guests uh, of honor were uh, John Nathan Turner, Gary Downey, Sylvester McCoy, and Nick Courtney. Everybody had a fantastic time and uh, it was absolutely wonderful. About five years later, John Nathan Turner called me up and asked if I was doing anything for the 30th anniversary. Uh, a little arm twisting and he managed to talk me into doing another one. So, uh, you know, from an original one-off, it became a second and then uh, 1996 we did another one and from then on it became pretty much an annual event. And uh, I have to say, it's been fun every time and uh, as long as it stays, uh, you know, fun to do and uh, don't lose too much money in the process. Uh, hope to keep doing them. I'm an avid statue collector, so anything statues. And currently, right now, we got a actually a pretty nice piece of uh, William Hart. One thing that you would buy if it was available: a talking canine, a full-size version, not the minis that they've done on a couple of toys, but a full-size version. Radio controlled, speaks, moves the head, spits up the information, talks to you, whole nine yards, completely interactive. Kind of like a Furby, but bigger. One thing we get asked all the time that's not really available now, 
is something to do with the TARDIS. You do not have a model of the TARDIS. I mean, they have done it in the past, but there's nothing available at the moment. It's either the money box or the phone alert, but we're always getting asked for TARDIS models, replicas, things like that, and there's nothing available. We've got a platform to film this, which actually is a hero version because it actually lights up. Same as the Resurrection of Darlings one, that's also a hero version because it lights up. It's just on the time of the gun. There's only two known to be made, and the other one is currently in the Blackboard exhibition. The Seventh Doctor. Also got Colin Baker's trousers and shirt. One of the oldest items I've got is a Sisterhood of Calm dress from Brain and Morbius. I've also got a headdress which also came from Bonham, from the Twin Dilemma. Here we have um, an original Adric costume, and this is Adric who is being um, converted into a Cyberman. Um, not quite sure what he did to deserve that, um, but there you go. On this side we have a whole pile of other costumes from Doctor Who, um, all sorts of things. Um, they've all got little labels on. I think that's from um, Caves of Androzani and Creature from the Pit, and all sorts of things. And he's from a story called The Leisure Hive. And this fella here is a Silurian from the story Warriors of the Deep. Unfortunately, he is very much the worst for wear, and latex is completely going. And next, if he falls over, this would just shatter. Yeah, uh, here we go. Like that one. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor Who. Sound Anything else you want to mention that I can pull oh, off wow. a shelf? Oh my goodness. Oh look, that's that's one of the original '60s ones. Ah! That's the only one I've got. It's broken, unfortunately. But it's all I've managed to get hold of. That's the original '60s. Just amazing. Yeah. Isn't that? They've just literally thought of everything, haven't they? Those laser etch key rings with the TARDIS in it. It's just a kind of a measure of just how popular Doctor Who is. That everybody is producing something with a Dalek on, with a Doctor on, with a TARDIS on, um, and it's so iconic that everybody wants to buy into that. It is such an extraordinary phenomenon. I mean, it really is. I mean, there's there's very little else like it out there. Down here, we have um, underpants, um, which are always good for a laugh, breaks the ice at parties. Oh, no! <laughs> that is just Doctor wicked. Heels. Dalek slippers, man. That is just but then, ultimate. Then you find something that is so absolutely ludicrous, and it makes you absolutely just scream with laughter. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. I've organised my, what I call, Doctor Who room into various cabinets. So as you can see, I've got a number of things here, which is not unique to, uh, to Doctor Who fan collecting, but some items that I particularly like. Um, the Turkish Doctor Who novelisations, the Doctor Kim version here of uh, Day of the Daleks is, uh, is something I enjoy collecting. Also, the, uh, one of my favourite covers, the Chris Akileos covers for the Doctor Who novelisations and the early Target novelisations were fantastic. And here is a Dutch version of Doctor Who and the Doomsday Weapon with a title I'm not going to pronounce. And I think one of my strangest items, which again Doctor Who collectors will have up and down the country, is a Weetabix box from 1977. I've got a bit of a thing about Doctor Who Weetabix boxes. And which Doctor Who collection wouldn't be complete without the Doctor Who annuals from the 1960s, the 1970s and the 1980s? I think my favourite merchandise would be the Target books. I absolutely loved collecting them and seeking them out at car boot sales and especially the Target books that expanded on the stories and, and that covered stories that I'd never seen, especially all the Hartnell Troutons. Now I'm not sure that the Doctor Who cookbook is a good thing or a bad thing because on the one hand it represents everything bad about the 1980s on the other hand, it does have a fish recipe called the Kipper of Triton. My The Who Shop International has been running now for, gosh, 22 years, I'm not old enough. And uh, I basically started the business um, from an idea that was uh, planted by my brother who went to a convention called Longleat. I then started the business off 1st of December 1984 in a warehouse in Wapping. Here at the Who Shop we like to look after everybody. We look after the classic fans of the show and we look after the new fans of the show. Items of props, 
costumes that were used in Hartnell times, up to most recently when we picked up a gas mask uh, that was used in the uh, Empty Child in the new season of Doctor Who when it first came back. Um, T-shirts, books, pens, videos, DVDs now, of course. When we opened, of course, everyone was a fantastic genre of the video. And now, of course, we've now changed on to the DVDs, the CD market, just everything you could possibly think of. Autographs, again, from number one Doctor right through up to number ten Doctor. Uh, just absolutely anything and everything the Doctor Who fan would want and need. This prop gun here is the oldest prop we've got in the shop. It was made for the William Hartnell episode. Galaxy 4. It's only made of painted plywood bits of, bits of coloured sticky tape. But as far as the camera is concerned, it looked absolutely great. Mostly these props are from Doctor Who. There's a couple of exceptions. Mask of Mandraga are in the top Horonymous's mask. The Metabelis crystal from the Green Death, just to the side here. And the Hand of Fear itself, sitting just in the corner. In the shop, we actually have a television heritage plate that was John Pertwee's. It was um, unveiled at the BBC Centre. There's one at the BBC Centre and there was one specially made. There was something that was created specifically for the Doctor. It has never happened before and hopefully I don't think it's ever going to happen again. And they made three. They did one for Mr Hartnell, one for Mr Troughton and one for Mr Pertwee. And we bid and we were lucky enough to get the John Pertwee one, which I absolutely, I treasure. I think one of the big things, one of the big differences between Doctor Who fandom and Star Trek fandom is when you meet Doctor Who fans, they all grew up to be in very creative sort of industries, you know. And there's a whole load of writers, a whole load of directors, a whole load of... Um, there's something about Star Trek fandom where they all wanted to go into established kind of... They all want to go into military or science or something, and that was just something I could never understand, the idea of aspiring to wear a uniform. Down at the BBC in London, Star Trek fans today staged a rally to return their favourite series to the screens. Here at BBC Leeds, the Who World Order have formed a demonstration in response and their message is simple. We do not want Star Trek back. We just came down here today to voice our opinion. We don't want trouble on nothing. I've got a family and I don't want them to face a world tomorrow blighted by the Trekkish scourge. I think the reason Particularly Doctor Who fans are quite productive in terms of videos and audios is that we want to get involved in the world of Doctor Who even though we know it's a TV program that's made by actors we love that fictional world and we want to try and take part in it ourselves by creating our own stories. So why are we here? Geographically this is the same spot we just left but some Mm, 1,300 or so years earlier. Doctor! Doctor! Would this TARDIS get can it go anywhere? At any time. Well, there's something affecting the TARDIS. Who are you? Being a woman is going to mean some changes. If you have a TARDIS bind in the house, I, I, I must insist on this. That's You're in great danger, madam. You mean you weren't always a woman? when you see one? I think my readings for these Mugatti are similar to yours to the mushroom. We've made a fan film called Tyranny of the Daleks. A fan film is basically where as a complete bunch of amateurs you get together, have a bit of fun, muck around and you never know you might actually make a film out of it as well. You know Romana, I can't help thinking there's something distinctly odd about the wildlife of this planet. Yes, yes, I hadn't forgotten about you. I think you know, what inspired the film was just uh, the love of Doctor Who for a number of people in our group and the desire to start filming and try and make a film on our own. A lot of us have a background with sort of role-playing games, and writing in general, fantasy fiction, all that sort of thing, a bit of acting, special effects, computer graphics. And really, in retrospect, it's almost sort of inevitable that we ended up making, making a film. Oh. Or maybe not! Brother men are too numerous. I agree. Well, Mana, we must go. Come on! Come on! Oh. Uh, we have a, a big collection of fan films, sort of just doing a bit of research on what else was going on. Uh, and there seemed to be kind of a, not too many with a heavy emphasis on action. So that's something we really want to explore and have a go at doing ourselves. 
and that's it's a lot of work. There's no no two ways about that. It is a lot of work. It is the hard. Sequences. The actions are the hardest bit. They're the most fun as well. Absolutely. And I, don't, I think all of us, I think none of us are shy of doing the action. None of us are shy of falling down or having a fight or trying different things, different movements, rather than just saying the lines. Excellent. This is the first project that, that we've ever worked on. This is the best film we've ever made. And then to suddenly be, have invites from conventions in America, for example, we want a higher quality version so they can show up on the big screen. It's just absolutely awesome. And we've had posters in, in science fiction magazines as well. You know, the, the response really has been yeah. absolutely extraordinary, really. People like it. That's, that's the amazing thing. with friends having a lot of fun, yeah. a lot yeah, of laughs, yeah. and people actually like watching it. All right, all right, I get the point. The key to time. 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 About 19 years ago, Rusty and I had a lot of fun making this movie, The Two Doctors and the Antimatter Menace. It was a Doctor Who spoof just because we were big Doctor Who fans and we wanted to have some fun making a video of our own. So we got together on a couple of cold March weekends and uh, made this thing. 19 years later, I still have my scarf. We're a little fatter and a little grayer. Rusty, I think, might be able to play the pervy doctor without any flour in his hair this time. Perhaps not this time. Okay. Star Trek versus Doctor Who was a lot of fun because it was largely improvised. We went in with an idea of what we were going to do and then turned up at the location and semi made it up as we went along and it was just so wonderfully silly and that communicated to the filming side of it. I invested my remaining funds in a one-man show, based on my showbiz memories. The one about the English Auton, the scum, ah! uh, standing on parade, trying to salute, and now I said you nodding dog in them when I start. I gave them the full works. Tears, laughter, famous friends. Jim lifting weights was no problem, and then he turned round and we were all wearing eye patches. Autumn Diaries 2 came from an initial suggestion from Bill Baggs and it became a lot more ambitious initially when I wrote it. It was practically designed to be filmed in a back garden and it, it just flowered until we were taking in uh, the Manchester Museum of Science and Industry. A lot more CGI work in it. And, the, and renting a theatre. I managed to keep myself occupied with a little business venture. It became from a very simple idea that was based around an interview into this little sort of mini epic. Dear old Auntie Beeb was making Doctor Who again. The whole idea behind Possibilities, um, which was a uh, Doctor Who played the film, was I'd made four films before that with a group of um, friends, uh, actors, and all different experience. But we met on the Doctor Who holiday, and also I knew that we could get it shown at a convention. It was kind of to up our profile a little bit. So I thought we'd do a short Doctor Who film. So I wrote the script as a half hour film and I picked up the idea from the TV movie. There's something terribly wrong here. Isn't there always? Yeah, because I was, uh, I was, at the time I was in post-production <coughs> on my feature film Soul Searcher, which was like the most stressful thing I've ever done in my entire life. And so uh, many people would say it was entirely sensible to then take on a, a second <laughs> directing job. Uh, directing a short film on top of that, but uh, for me, directing possibilities like a little holiday. <laughs> in a most of the, the in a mo well, exactly. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's always the way. The producer is always the one that has the stress on the movie, and uh, I was producing Soul Searcher myself. Rob was producing Possibilities, so I just got the fun of directing it. 
um, and, uh, and editing it and didn't have to worry about all the, the organising and getting people together on the same days and whether they'd actually turn up for, at 6 o'clock in the morning at Ealing Shopping Centre or wherever. We shot over two weekends and we had a different crew for each weekend and they didn't really know anything about Doctor Who. And so I don't know what it must have been like for them trying to understand what the hell was going on. Was like, you get that building in the background, the fans will recognise that building. <laughs> They must have thought we were nuts. Where are you, I wonder? The Daleks are waiting, quietly planning and scheming and hating. Straight to see. Yes, the very first Doctor Who show I did, which was the first time I played the Doctor and did anything like that, was in 1996. And so we did this Doctor Who show called The Planet of Storms, which was all about the, the, the terrible Zodian. I created the terrible Zodian. And it did quite well, but Rob Thrush came to see it, being a local Doctor Who fan. So the following year in the summer, he did The Millennium Track, which was his film, fan film, which is quite famous now. But Rob said he wanted to do Love Fear on stage, and I think, that, yes, that was the first of the lost stories we did, so that was in April 2000. And um, because I think it was one of the lost stories, we sold out the day we started rehearsing. And then we decided, or he decided, to follow it up with a sequel, which was Spirit from the Deep, which we did two years later, and that was at the New Theatre Royal. And again, it was very successful. And then when Doctor Who was coming back, obviously for the new series, I was getting excited and, and I just decided to put a Doctor Who episode on and I put on Evil the Daleks Part 2, which I happened to have on my Dalek early years tape and I just watched it and I was thinking about what show to do in 2006 because I have one booked for 2005 and I thought, hmm, I wonder if we could do Doctor Who again because it might be nice because the series is coming back and blah blah blah, blah. so and I approached the BBC and they were very helpful and said yes that's fine. That was it. There we were. Evil of the Daleks was on track and we fixed the date, which was October 2006. They would not be here if I hadn't opened the way for them. They couldn't have known the terror they were going to unleash. They invaded the house, took away my daughter. But now creatures from a world in a distant future will have the power. What do you expect? For pity's sake, let me go! The power to enslave the entire human race. I am their savior. They will give me what I want. And only one man has the knowledge to stop them. Uh, then we should read the script and then we'll have a quick tea break. Uh, if we've got time, hopefully we will. And then we should come back and there are various things I need to tell you and then some things to distribute to you in regards to the interactive presses. I'm Martin, I'm the composer. I'm Rosie, I'm playing Victoria. I'm James, I'm playing Maxwell. I'm John Hall, I'm playing Jamie. I'm Phil, I'm Major Arthur Terrell, and a Climax star. <laughs> 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 became involved because um, I met Nick when I did a couple of Big Finish audios when I was working professionally as an actor. He got to a year before the show and just struck me that I wondered if Nick could come and do the voices for the show because that would A, be exciting for us as fans because you know, he'd been in Doctor Who by then directly and for him being a Dalek nut and a fan, he'd probably like it as well. So I asked him and, and he said, yes, I'd love to. And we sorted out that you know, the dates were compatible. We booked a bit. Where is your companion? Jamie? He is here. We have done everything you asked. Why do you ask him about Jamie? He is the human being who is to be tested. What do you mean? Tested how? My name is Rosie Grant. I'm playing Victoria Waterfield. Uh, my name's John Paul McCrone, I'm playing Jamie McCrimmon in, um, in Evil of the Daleks. Where is Victoria Waterfield? What's happened to her? She's a prisoner. The Daleks. It's all going well, it's kind of at that exciting stage now where we're just a couple of days away from show week and it's, it's just smoothing out all those last little creases but I think it's going to be, it's going to be something really quite special and yeah. it's going to be very exciting and uh, yeah, we're having a great time doing it. What are you doing? Yes! I knew it! Fingers 
across, we might even sell out, you never know, but we'll certainly get to 2,000, I think. We raised, I can't remember the exact figure, but it was just under £13,000. We also raised £518.80 for children in need. Finally! Doctor auditions, take one. OK, Tom, and action! I am known as the... Sorry, what's the line? Cut! How do fans come about? Uh... So, I understand you and Archie have been at each other's throats for years. Yes, at times things have been quite nasty. You've exchanged blows. We've exchanged emails. He thinks he should be president of the Online Appreciation Society. But everyone knows I'm the bestest Lord High President ever. Group of like-minded people, we meet down the pub every two weeks. I thought, well okay, let's do an audio project. Let, let's keep the interest of the group going, Let, let's do an audio project. Now, the problem there is that there are so many people out there doing audio projects. Audio Doctor Who, I mean even, you know, I mean, right back to the audio visuals. There have been people doing audio Doctor Who for centuries. Who am I? Great, Jeff. But the line is, I am the Doctor. We're not doing the TV movie. The best thing I know is about being a Doctor Who fan. I wanted to do something about fans, and it had to be a comedy, purely because we were all unknowns. I didn't know if anybody could act. I didn't know if I could write comedy. I didn't know if we could do the music. I didn't know if we could do the post-production. I knew none of that. So let's do comedy and let's make it about Doctor Who fans. And that's what fans is all about. The uh, documentary? Oh, right, yes. <clears throat> Let us take you on a journey, charting the success of what was to have been the greatest fan video ever made, but wasn't. On four CDs. Coming soon. Doctor Who. We could improvise with this mask. The spin-off dramas that have come as a result of Doctor Who have in a way been a sort of lifeline to the business for me. Because they're uh, always very flatteringly very grateful to have you along because you've got a little bit of a name. Um, and because they are low budget, um, they don't often get you, you know, so-called celebrities to, to give their services. They'd be fun. I mean, you have to scan swallow hard sometimes, there's no car, there's no way to change properly, makeup's done in the pouring rain under a kind of canopy, you get cold, there's, you know, there's all those drawbacks if you're used to a bit of a mini bacon, but again, you know, it's a salutary lesson, it, it's, it's, reminds you of the craft and why you're really there. Well, I'm lucky enough to run the Hoovers, which is, which is um, a Doctor Who local group based in Derby, but we have members from all over the Midlands, from Stoke on Trent, from South Yorkshire, all over the place. Well, we gather together once a month, we watch some videos, we play some silly games, we, we do uh, uh, Desert Island Docks, we do Who's My Line, we do all sorts of silly games. One of the most important things about Doctor Who is the fetishism. Wait a minute, I have to laugh. <laughs> now, I don't mean that in a funny way. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it's that when I was a kid, we used to go into W. H. Smiths, and there'd be the Target novels. And if you remember what the Target novels looked like in the seventies, absolutely fantastic. And they were, they were kind of like our because in those days we didn't have video. They were sort of like our memories of what the program was, but made more intense. A giant fly, for example, in the Green Death, which looks pathetic on the screen. You get the book, and on the cover it's this massive, great giant fly that looks like. And then you look inside, look, like real giant maggots. It's brilliant. Yeah. Um, and so you know, you take that away as a kind of little way of remembering the television programme in the days before you could actually watch it and take whenever you liked. I've been taking famous pieces of artwork throughout history and trying to turn them into Doctor Who things. Um, for example, I've got this picture of uh, Leonardo da Vinci's here, which is um, a famous one with the guy with his arms and legs stretched out, as you can see, and this half is an ordinary person and that's Paul McGann's face. Um, but the other half is a Cyberman, um, one of the new designs of the Cybermen. If you actually talk to an awful lot of Doctor Who fans, their they're writers and their directors and they're in, they're in, they're in creative industries. I got lucky. 
basically the answer. I'd love to be able to, you know, have this, this really good sort of origin story where I can say, oh, I got involved in Doctor Who, but the truth is, no, I just sent something to Virgin and they accepted it. Well, I say they accepted it, you know. They accepted it after three years, because Gareth Roberts dropped it down the back of a cupboard. But then after three years, they read it and they accepted it, and you know, that's it. I kind of started writing professionally for Doctor Who as a sort of um, an ex extension of what I was doing at the time. Um, I always had a love of the Target Doctor Who novelisations. I'd always loved them, and I always loved the cover art. Um, so because I was always in touch with um, all of the editors at um, WH Allen and then Virgin, um, where I was talking with Peter Darvill Evans, who was the editor at the time, to get hold of some news for the frame or, or whatever it was, I can't remember now. And I remember saying to Peter, and well, when are you going to get me to do a book for you then? And he looked at me and he said, well, when are you going to offer me one? Well, I've always, always been a writer, ever since I was sort of six or seven or eight, writing stories in old school textbooks and whatever. So I've always, I suppose, at the back of my mind, wanted to be a writer when I grew up. And in fact, I became a, a writer. I was a technical writer for a large computer company for a long time. And while I was doing that, I submitted a, a proposal for a Doctor Who novel to Virgin Books, who were then doing the Doctor Who original fiction. And it got taken up, so I, I got to write that book, which was called Theatre of War, and uh, kept writing Doctor Who books ever since, really. We tell us publishing. We're kind of just publishing the sorts of books that we want to read, um, and I think that's quite important. Okay, well these are um, some of the Telos books. This is the kind of the Telos archive um, that we actually have here. So we have all of our um, Doctor Who novellas up the top, um, including the, the very rare um, 40th anniversary edition of Eye of the Tiger. Now, I mean, I've always been a fan. I've always been a fan at heart. I love Doctor Who. I love what I do. I love publishing. I love horror. I love horror films. Um, I love great fiction. Um, it's really nice to get together with other professional writers, as we do at uh, the Fantasy Con every year. Um, and talk about writing and the art of writing and publishing and you know setting the, the wrongs of the industry to rights as you do um, but it's also nice to just to pick up a book and read it from someone you've never heard of before um, that's that can be really nice I'm doing a range of books under the Faction Paradox title which um, I'm not gonna lie about this I'm not gonna pretend they did come directly out of Doctor Who my job basically is is one of consultancy there's a commissioning editor who at the moment is Stuart Cooper at BBC Books who's responsible for all Doctor Who books and uh, basically I, I do what he tells me which uh, involves uh, suggesting what books we should be doing. Really good Doctor Who dates badly. Um, Doctor Who shouldn't be something where you go, oh this is a wonderful piece of television that will never date and it'll never go out to stuff. No, you should be able to look at the 60s stories and go that looks 60s. You should be able to look at the 80s stories and go, ah, look at their hair. You know, and I would like very much for people to look back at the early, you know, 2000s story, the stories from 2005 and go, yeah, you can tell when that was made. Good. You should be able to. It is now. The Doctor's not necessarily the sort of character that a lot of people, if they were having to make up a science fiction character or a fantasy character, would come up with. So I think the fact that it's, it's off the wall, that it's offbeat, that it's different, uh, is something that's helped it along and the, the new series certainly follows in that trend as well. I think I think the new series has been brilliant I mean to the point where I can't it, it's slightly more difficult to watch the old stuff it acknowledges new trends in, in, in narrative uh, but it also but it also engages you emotionally and that's that's not something that the, the old series ever ever did. I can't say enough nice things about the new series it's, it's amazing I mean it's uh, it was it com completely exceeded my expectations. My parents both died 2001, within six months of each other, and it wasn't until two, uh, this sounds really sad. It wasn't until 2003 when they announced that Doctor Who was coming out again. I just said to Sam, my wife, I feel safe again. The Doctor's back in town because up until that point I'd been an orphan. I absolutely love the new series, um, and you know, I, I think it's a great um, continuation of the tradition. It's got the essence of Doctor Who in there. And of course, some of the newspapers started to echo what fandom was saying: "Is it why did it take you 15 years to realise that you had this potential here? Because it, it was always there, of course. And as fans, we we thought we knew that it was there, but it took Russell Davis and his team to actually bring that out and to make a series." which appealed to children particularly, 
but also adults and also to the fans uh, and that was the biggest trick of all was to try and actually come out with something which appealed to everyone. Now with the advent of the new series coming in, it's now moved slightly, so we're seeing lots and lots of children coming in. I suddenly felt that a new generation of Doctor Who fans were going to be found. Of course, hot on the heels of a success comes people who want to make money off that success, and that means merchandise. Who would have thought that the new series of Doctor Who would have generated so much merchandise from Doctor Who slippers, to Dalek t-shirts, to Dalek cakes, to Easter eggs. So here behind me represents a year's collecting of Doctor Who merchandise. We've got books, we've got new books, we've got magazines, we've got sticker books, we've got underpants, loads and loads of underpants, um, t-shirts, pyjamas, pens, um, DVDs, audios, Absolutely every single range you can think of seems to be producing something with Doctor Who on. I am so impressed with how the series has reinvented itself again and made itself so popular. I was definitely watching the, uh, the new Doctor Who because I'm quite, I think Dave Tennant's a fantastic actor and it was amazing to meet him during the read through in Cardiff. That was great. <laughs> So when the series came back after this you know, enormous great break after 1989, you just thought, well, you can't just watch it in isolation in a room. Why not try and do what they do so well at conventions, which is bring people together, enjoy the countdown, enjoy the moment, celebrate the fact that you've brought back one of the most iconic series that's ever been made anywhere in the world and just have an awful lot of fun with it. It only remains really for me to say a big thank you to everyone here. And as you probably guessed, thanks to Doctor Who magazine, we've got an absolute capacity crowd this evening. I hope the future for Doctor Who is going to be very rosy. Uh, I mean, as for the fans, well, they will always be there. The great strength Doctor Who has is that it can, if it, pardon the pun, regenerate itself. It's proved it can do it time and time and again. The future of Doctor Who, I think it will go on as long as there are fans and people who are willing to get involved and if the BBC is willing to get involved with the fans. That's why we have the new series. Because of Doctor Who's changing templates over the years, the, the changing nature of Doctor Who, everybody feels as though they have a claim on a certain era. And I think that's very, very important to its preciousness in some people's lives. I think the future is very bright for Doctor Who. Um, and now it's back, it's going from strength to strength, and it will continue to do so. There will still be fans, there will still be fan productions, there will still be fan magazines and websites, there will still be merchandise coming out. It, it sounds corny, but there's no reason why it shouldn't continue to run. I think my only worry will be if I pass off the mortal call before I've seen the final, final episode. It's made me a very, very, very happy boy principally because my 12-year-old daughter is now a major Doctor Who fan. It is now actually a family event. You know, we sit down here on a Saturday night, we watch the TV. What I'd like to say about the fans, I mean, it's hippy-dippy and sloppy, but I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful they've hung on in there through thick and thin and uh, appreciate your work and appreciate your dedication. Come and see other stuff that you do. It's not just solely Doctor Who based. I'm grateful.
Well, that was happening. 